So, very excited to be here. Uh, I'm very excited we're able to get Jason De La Rocca here. Um, and like I said, he's one, uh, uh, Jason De La Rocca, he's one of the most well-known and connected contacts in the industry. He is a game guru. Everyone knows him in North America. If you're connected with gaming, you know Jason. Uh, he recently embarked on his most ambitious project yet. Execution Labs is a first-of-its-kind hybrid game incubator and a go-to market accelerator that helps independent game developers produce games and bring them to market. So I'm looking forward to see what he has to say. So please help me welcome with this discussion on fearless innovation, Jason Della Rocca. Thank you, Neil. All right, I have the... All righty. So my first time in, uh, in Romania, uh, it's very wet and lots of uh, traffic. Um, and the, and the clubs are very loud. But, uh, so, so Execution Labs, is, as Neil mentioned, is, uh, is an accelerator for game startups. So I'm very uh, focused on game development where uh, failure is quite common. Uh, and uh, having the right attitude towards failure, I think, is, is very important. So you know, we're investing in teams. We're investing in, in young uh, startups doing games. And there's a lot of, um, of the coaching that we do is towards their attitude towards uh, a failure. Whenever I'm in a, a, a foreign uh, country talking to strangers, I like to share some, some sex stories just to kind of warm, warm things up. Uh, Daphnia is not the name of my girlfriend, but the name of a uh, river fly, a water crustacean, has a particularly interesting sex life. Uh, when the environment is stable, uh, they don't have sex. They just clone themselves to reproduce. So they make an exact copy. The assumption is if they're surviving in this stable environment, then you know, an exact copy of themselves will do just as well. What's interesting is when the environment is disrupted, when there's a, a drought or a, you know, a food supply issue or the new predator, they start having sex. And it's not because you know, they think it's the end of the world and so they're going to have some fun, but rather <laughs> because they want to introduce error into the reproductive process. I mean, all the combination of DNA you you know, introduce potential for mutations and adaptions, et cetera, um, in the hopes that one of those errors, one of those mutations is better suitable to survive in this disrupted environment. Uh, you know, a different color so the predator can't see it or they have a, I don't know, a smaller stomach so they need less food or, or whatever the case may be. And when I heard this story or, or learned about the Daphne, I thought it was a particularly interesting kind of metaphor for, for us, for technology, for, for innovators. This idea of we can't just clone ourselves you know, based on a stable environment because the environment is never stable. And this is true particularly in games, but I think it's true pretty much anyone trying to uh, innovate in, in technology and build companies, that the environment is always uh, in a state of disruption. Um, and and you know, this idea of success and failure, I think we tend to have uh, you know, an attitude where we all try our best to succeed. Our, 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 our attitude is, I'm here to do the best that I can possibly do. I want to win. Uh, and if you fail, then you know, the ones that uh, have a good attitude say, oh, well, I'll just pick myself back up and I'll learn from those failures and try not to do the same mistakes again. And that's certainly uh, one healthy approach to uh, believing in failure. But what I'm suggesting is we actually want to induce failure. Right? It's not a question of just wanting to succeed and then learning from the failure, but is how can we actually leverage failure in order to succeed. Um, some of these ideas towards failure, I first came across them from this professor, this is Tracy Fullerton from the University of Southern California, a very well-known game uh, professor, game academic. Uh, and I walked into a conference about 10 years ago where she was giving the keynote speech, uh, and she was on stage saying how much she wanted her students to fail. And she loved it when her students failed. And I thought, well, that's a really mean professor to you know, want all their students to fail. Uh, but then she sort of expanded on that. And to her, what failure meant was that they were pushing the boundaries, that they were experimenting, they were exploring what was possible. Uh, and it didn't mean failure in the sense of giving them an F to fail the class, but giving, uh, but, but giving them the opportunity to explore and, and experiment. I thought that was a particularly interesting way to think about uh, failure. I, I went off to Ireland for another conference. Uh, for those of you who game might recognize these as sort of screenshots from a very classic game called Breakout which is you have the ball at the bottom that you bounce up and it breaks blocks you know, on the upper screen. And many programmers, as they're learning to program, will make a clone, a version of that game. So this is 
just a bunch of screenshots from breakout clones. Um, and so I went to Ireland and I was giving a, a speech at a conference there and there was a new degree, a new program at the university to teach game development. And they were very happy about this new program uh, and they were talking about the sort of the capstone project, the project at the end of the program was to create a breakout clone. And I thought this was kind of sad in that, uh, you know, students without the burden of, of uh, you know, bosses and marketing and budgets and all that kind of stuff should be experimenting, they shouldn't necessarily be spending their time copying or cloning things. Um, and the professor said, well, I don't know how to grade innovation. And I thought it was a particularly, I mean, maybe in some ways telling, but also a very sad statement, um, you know, about, about innovation. Um, there's this great book uh, called The Innovator's Dilemma. It's probably a decade or plus old. How many have read this book, Innovator's Dilemma? So a few of you. Uh, excellent, but it has nothing to do with video games. It's about sort of innovation and technology in general. And just to summarize, the innovator's dilemma is that the very things you do to succeed today are the things that hold you back from succeeding tomorrow. Kind of going back to the Daphnia is because the environment is never stable. Things are always changing. And so the, the companies that optimize for the environment that exists today, as the environment shifts, has a very difficult time to succeed under the new rules. And in fact, the more successful you are today, the harder it is for you to make that shift as the rules, as the, as the, as the environment uh, changes. Uh, and so again, this sort of implies a certain degree of failure. This is often why the most successful companies today are not necessarily the most successful companies five years, 10 years from now. And oftentimes when there's you know, major shifts or disruptions in technology, it's new companies uh, you know, that are, that are successful ones. Um, and this is true in the game industry as well as uh, many, many other industries. Uh, and so I think of often of, of Darwin when it comes to uh, innovation, or I, I try to think of things systematically, um, and, and really in a, in, a, in a Darwinistic system of evolution, there's three kind of fundamental uh, pillars. One is that you want a high degree of variation. Right, so if you're thinking of the Daphnia that are trying to reproduce and adapt to the environment, you want a lot of mutations, a lot of adaptions, so that hopefully one of, out of a million, one out of a billion, has that sort of change that allows it to succeed. So you want a lot of variety, you want a lot of um, uh, differentiation. Uh, another is, um, you know, how do you determine fitness, or how do you determine who, you know, who wins or survives or not uh, in the environment? And the third is a high degree of survivability. So that any one failure, any one mutation, any one error doesn't take down the whole species. It doesn't sort of contaminate the whole gene pool. Uh, and so if you think of a corporate context, you know, how can you fail, how can you innovate within a larger environment or, 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 or a community, uh, and any one experiment, any one failure doesn't bankrupt the company, doesn't sort of you know, cause problems for the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, in terms of technology, certainly in games and, and just sort of the mobile space in general, I mean, for the most part, we're doing okay in terms of variation. I mean, there's an app for everything. There's a game pretty much for any taste. Uh, there's a website. There's a bit of technology, a gadget uh, that pretty much addresses anything. So on the whole, I would say we're doing relatively well in terms of, uh, you know, variation. Uh, in terms of uh, fitness determination, I mean, we're businesses, right? So oftentimes it's a question of, you know, who's making money? That's revenue. Who, who, who's actually... Selling, selling units uh, so determines you know, degree of fitness. Uh, but this idea of survivability is an interesting one of sort of the how do you survive failure, uh, I always find particularly uh, interesting. Uh, and there's another great book called The Medici Effect, uh, which you know, links this idea of, of uh, failure and success. Uh, the book itself is more broadly about um, innovation happening at the intersection of two things where breakthroughs happen you know, at the intersection of two cultures or two cuisines or two uh, you know, academic disciplines. Uh, when you sort of intersect those things, that's where the real interesting stuff occurs. Uh, but there was a, th this whole section on, on um, success. And the author did a whole bunch of research in terms of correlating or, or trying to discover what correlates most highly with success uh, as individuals. And looking at stuff like um, you know, economic status, uh, uh, you know, where they're from in the world, cultural background, education, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and at the end of the day, it was none of those things. The thing that most highly correlated with success was quantity, or what he called quantity and quality. 
that the, for example, the, the musicians that played or wrote the most music also made the best music or had the most successful music. The, the painters who painted the most paintings also had the most highly valued paintings. The academics who wrote the most papers were also cited in, in the most papers and had sort of the most success. Um, and he had all these examples of quantity sort of uh, um, correlating most highly with quality and sort of the implied assumption that not all of it is good. And uh, I mean, we're not in America here, but baseball, th this is uh, Babe Ruth. Um, you know, for those who don't know, he held the home run uh, record for, for, for many, many years, one of the most well-known best baseball players of all time. Uh, and he, so he's known as being the home run, you know, king. But he also, what a lot of people don't know, is he had the record for the most misses. So again, this correlation between quantity and quality. So he swung at everything. Every time that ball came, he just swung, which meant that he had you know, a lot of home runs, but it also meant he missed the ball a lot. Uh, and so this idea of volume being an important factor in quality uh, is, is an interesting one. In the game industry, we, we see this uh, quite often. These are two uh, game designers, um, Kyle Gabler and Ron Carmel. Uh, they invented one of the best or made one of the best selling uh, games on the iPad called uh, World of Goo. Uh, and um, I mean, it's a bit old by today's standard. Uh, this came out, I think, in 2008, 2009, um, but still remains one of the best selling games of all the time. Uh, this grew out of a, of a project um, that they made while they were in school. So this is an article at one of our industry websites called Gamma Sutra, uh, where they were students at Carnegie Mellon in uh, Pittsburgh, and in addition to their master's level uh, work uh, or, or studies, they made 50 games in a semester. So essentially every week, the different students would start a new game, and they would work on it for the week, and at the, you know, the next Monday, they would stop and start a new game. And they produced 50 games. I mean, more like prototypes, not you know, complete games, of course. Uh, one of those 50 games was World of Goo, which, as I mentioned, became one of the best-selling games of all time on iPad. The other 49 games, I have no clue. Garbage, right? They're just junk. Uh, and they had to produce the 49 crap ones in order to discover or uncover the one good one. Right? If they sat down at the beginning of the semester and say, okay, fellow students, let's sit here and come up with the one idea that's going to be a best-selling game, the likelihood of them being able to do that is almost nil. Uh, and so we have many, many examples of, of that within the, the game industry. Um, and, and this idea of success really being the improbable thing. Another great book, The Black Swan, um, sort of a more of an economics uh, uh, book and statistics book, uh, talking about uh, probabilities where... I mean, in many ways, those kinds of successes are the improbable things. I mean, the game industry in particular is a hit-driven business. You're, you're either making no money or you're making a billion dollars. I mean, the, the scale of, of variability, did my mic just turn off? Uh, oh, there we go. Is, is uh, you know, it, it's a big delta. You either suck or you're champions. Uh, and so it's very hard to predict, you know, that kind of success, you know, and, and to sort of uh, estimate sale. I mean. You know, uh, for those of you who are in there pitching investors, the, the slide that's the most painful one is your sales estimates and revenue projections, because everyone knows you're just pulling those numbers from your butt. Um, but it's even more so true in the game industry, because it's usually, it, it's binary. Either it's, it's zero or it's, or it's millions and millions. Um, but there's this, this interesting concept from the book called the, the turkey problem, um, more, more formally known in psychology as, a, as a, uh, the induction, induction problem, induction challenge, where as human beings, uh, we tend to be very bad at uh, predicting the future. Well, I suppose that makes, a little, you know, makes sense, but we often over rely on historical data and assume that sort of, you know, future will just be a linear function. So they call it a turkey problem because, um, uh, so, so imagine a turkey, you know, most days it wakes up, the farmer comes out to feed it, it eats, you know, goes to the bathroom, goes to sleep at night, wakes up the next morning, the farmer comes back, feeds it again, you know, and this is its cycle. So if you ask the turkey, you know, what does tomorrow look like, the turkey will say, well, I'm going to wake up, the farmer's going to come and feed me, and I'm going to go to the bathroom and, you know, go back to sleep. And then, well, for, at least for American turkeys, then it's Thanksgiving. 
and the farmer comes to, to kill it. So, there, so there's nothing in, in the turkey's worldview in historical data that enables it to predict Thanksgiving. It has no idea that tomorrow it's dying. And so as humans, we tend to have similar problems, not that someone's coming with an ax for us, but, but just this idea that we over, over rely or over reliant on historical data to predict, uh, predict our, our future. Um, and, and Angry Birds, I mean, I'm assuming everyone's played uh, Angry Birds, is, is kind of an example of this. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a story that's been told a few times now, but uh, Rovio, uh, the studio that makes Angry Birds, uh, uh, based in Helsinki, uh, you know, it was impossible for them to predict that they were going to create this billion-selling game. That, that it's kind of this, this joke that it's an overnight success because it, they made 51 games before they made Angry Birds. Right? Nobody knows what those other 51... Has anyone ever played another game you know, before Angry Birds existed from Rovio? No, like, like, not, like not even me, and I've been in the game industry for years and years. So they, they were a startup. They were a startup. They started the company... I think it was yeah, 2003, so they've been around for over, over a decade. You know, they were making mobile games before the iPhone existed, so they were doing it primarily for Nokia feature handsets and J2Me and Brand, uh, Brew and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, in some degree of, you know, they survived because they, they made it to 2009, so six years is not that bad, uh, but they were about to go out of business. Right? They were about to go broke, uh, and they said, well, let's, let's give it one more shot. We'll make one more game. Uh, and they sketched, you know, 10 ideas a day. They worked on a bunch of prototypes and concepts. And then one day they came up with the idea of, of Angry Birds. And then, you know, we, we know the rest of the, the story of billion plus downloads and hundreds of millions of dollars uh, later. Uh, but I mean, they, again, as turkeys, they had no idea. They couldn't predict, well, let's do these sketches and make a little red bird and we know there's going to be a billion dollars. They had to go through that process, they had to make the 50 games before that didn't generate the success. They had to go through the sketching and prototyping and iterating process as a means to uncover or discover what was going to be successful without knowing uh, ahead of time. And again, we see, we see examples of this. And I'm sure you know, in your own industries, your own sectors, the own areas that you're involved in, you can think of similar examples. This is another one um, from the game industry uh, from uh, the, the studio that made Rock Band and Guitar Hero. So, uh, so Iran Argozi, Alex Rogopoulos, co-founders of a company called Harmonix out of Boston. These are graduates from the MIT Media Lab, very prestigious, you know, technical, creative school. Uh, and they were always sort of fiddling with uh, uh, technology, music, interactivity, trying to make a game, trying to make something that allowed us as players, as people, to interact with our music. Uh, and they had some minor progress over the years, but for about 10 years, they really struggled. Uh, and, this, and the article goes on about how they had to borrow money and they almost lost it all and they almost went out of business and all this kind of stuff and all the failures they had along the way. And then 10 years later, they make Guitar Hero, which generates you know, over a billion dollars. And then a few years after that, they make Rock Band, which also becomes a billion dollar uh, franchise. And so you know, I, I can go on and on about examples of, of this where um, you know, failure is, is the necessary ingredient to success. Another great book, Stephen Johnson's Where Good Ideas Come From, sort of talk about the, the time effect for innovation. You know, often we think of it as this kind of overnight thing, as I gave the example of Angry Birds, but it's more this kind of accumulation of errors, the accumulation of, of um, you know, little steps moving forward, moving forward, that then all of a sudden things unlock, and that's where you know, the real uh, amazing stuff comes from. And so we don't often place value on, on those attempts, on those failures. We don't see it as necessary, as, as part of the learning, uh, learning process. Um, this book also, they had the, the whole story about the Daphnia, the, the sex life of the insect. So I don't normally research insect sex lives. I, I, I thought it was a fun story from the book. But, uh, so no, again, another great book that goes on uh, quite, quite extensively about, uh, about innovation. Um, also from that book is this, he brings up the concept of uh, survivorship bias. And, and I think we all kind of get stuck on this uh, quite a bit. So this is uh, the classic example of survivorship bias comes from World War II, uh, where there were the, the bomber planes, um, and the, the bombers were getting shot down. So the Allied bombers are going in, trying to, I don't know, I forget where they were flying, we're trying to protect uh, you know, the civilians and stuff, but the bombers kind of get, kept getting shot down. And um, you know, lives are being lost because they weren't able to protect the territory, plus the pilots, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a big problem for the military. 
And they said, well, let's, you know, let's try to fix this. So they looked at the planes that came back, and they saw where the bullet holes were, and they started patching up the airplanes, and they were going to send them back, back out. And then there was a, a researcher, and unfortunately I forget the researcher's name, said, that's not going to work. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the exact opposite of what we need to be doing. And everyone was confused. They said, well, these, if these are the planes that have come back with bullet holes, patching, you know, the, the, what that's doing is it's showing us where, in fact, the, the airplanes are strongest because they, they survived. They didn't crash. So we need to go out in the field and find the planes that crash and see where they've been shot, and then that's going to tell us you know, where, where we need to uh, patch up the planes. Uh, and so that's what they did, and so they looked at the failures as opposed to the survivors, as opposed to the successes, and that you know, enabled them to protect the planes and run their bombing sorties, and you know, it all, all worked out uh, you know, fantastically well. But, but so this is an example where we often look at the successes only and then try to clone them or try to emulate what the successes have done as opposed to look at who else has failed uh, and learn. That's why events like this are so important, this kind of notion of, of sharing uh, and not having, sort of not being embarrassed to share your, your failures is actually quite, uh, quite important. Um, this is a picture from our, our, our lab where we encourage teams to um, you know, fail as quickly as possible and as often as possible. Uh, and, and really early on. So, so this here kind of chunk of cardboard with these little you know, colored pieces of paper is a prototype for a video game. So the designers have an idea of this, you know, a game they want to produce. So say, get it on paper. You know, get a rough version of the rule set of the systems on paper and put that in front of people and see, you know, do they understand it? Is there some enjoyment out of it? As opposed to spending six months of programming and doing artwork and then realizing it sucks. Uh, and so, you know, we often encourage, or well, in fact, in many ways we force this process of, of early failure iteration, uh, you know, very, very early on in the process. I'm sure most people in the room have read The Lean Startup. I'm assuming um, this one's well known. Uh, what most people don't realize is The Lean Startup is an instruction manual for failing. Right? I mean, the whole build, measure, learn loop I mean, like, Eric Ries doesn't say it that way. I mean, he says, yeah, failure is important, you're, and it's neutral, so you're, you know, if it's, a, if it's a success or failure, it's just another point of learning, and you're kind of going through your build, measure, learn loop. But in fact, it is, it is an instruction manual to induce failure, to go through and encourage failure as a, as a discovery, uh, discovery process. And I, don't, and, I, and I don't think people necessarily view it in that way, because, again, they're kind of embarrassed or ashamed of, of, uh, of failure. Uh, Supercell is another example in the game industry. This is a startup from 2010, also in Finland. Uh, and you know, they, were, they, they were generating, within two or three years, games that were making uh, $5 million a week, or even $5 million a day, like just crazy amounts of money uh, on free games, on freemium games. Uh, and they were bought, uh, they sold half the company last year for $1.5 billion. Um, and they were like maybe 100 people. But they, you know, so massive success, massive success. But internally, they had this process of iteration and failure. That although at the time when they got purchased, they had only released two games, internally, they had produced many prototypes, had done a lot of these iterations. Uh, and actually, just last night, I was, I was hearing about another company called a, one of the German companies, Wuga that celebrates their internal failures. That they kind of have the, you know, up on the wall, they have all the different games that they killed uh, during development because it just wasn't up to the quality. They just didn't believe the success was going to come. Um, and so not necessarily shaming or, 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 or being ashamed of failures within, within the company. So really embracing this uh, idea of, of failure uh, as a means to uncover the successful game, I think, is, is, is really important. Uh, we see that from a, from a VC point of view. right? VCs often think, or investors often think incrementally as well. right? They, 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 they want to see you failing. They want to see you iterating. They want to see you try something, learn, you know, change directions, or you know, the famous pivot, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, they're thinking in this way. And often, I find there's a mismatch in terms of attitude towards the entrepreneurs, towards the creators, who really believe they have that solution for success, and they're just sort of going in that straight line, where VCs know that it's kind of BS, and they know that you're going to shift and iterate and change and pivot. Uh, along the way, and so the the more we embrace that kind of attitude and leverage it, 
uh, you know, the more likely we'll be kind of in line or in the, with alignment with, uh, with, with investors. And so going back to the, to the Daphnia, this idea of, of, of disruption, the idea of, you know, the environment is always shifting, it's always changing. We can't just clone ourselves. We can't just copy what someone else has succeeded with. We have to innovate. We have to change. And doing so requires us to, to fail. Um, and, and again, it's not just this idea of I'm going to try and if I fail, then I'll learn something. But how do I build a system that actually enables me to fail rapidly, learn from it, recover, change directions, and, and sort of induce it intentionally as a means to discover success, not just sort of you know, pick up after, after a failure. Uh, and so these, again, are a lot of the things that we do at Execution Labs. It's certainly, um, you know, in the West, uh, kind of more the, the attitude towards entrepreneurship that we have, that failure is good, failure is important. Um, but again, I would just encourage you to get out there and, and fail a whole bunch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. It was really good. I think... We need to hear these sort of speeches more often. Well, um, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, again, it's a question of attitude. I mean, I, you know, I think of it as a cliff. When I see a cliff, I'm like, look, there's a cliff. I'm going to jump off of it. And, and then I'll see, you know, what do I learn from that? Whereas most people spend their time looking over the cliff, wondering, that's too scary. Maybe I, should, I shouldn't. Whereas I'm saying, go, go run off the cliffs and... You know. I think it's most common um, around here for people to stay, you know, and look at the cliff and like, okay, so the angle is 45 degrees, yeah. I need to have three pair of wings, and then they get way too much ready, yeah. you know, instead of just jumping in and doing it. Uh, do you guys have any questions for Jason? It could be a bad question. If your question sucks, it's just a discovery process to the next question. There's one there. Yeah. You're going to run over with a... Microphone. Yes, sir. Hi, Jason. Uh, okay. Thanks for the great talk. Um, quick question regarding the game industry, since, as you mentioned, it has become pretty much winner takes so all. Either mm. you make no money or you may not make a ton of cash. And as you mentioned, you need a lot of projects to actually get to something that succeeds eventually and to learn from the failures. How much is the game stacked? against developers and towards environments that can produce more things in parallels like labs and publishers which you know you get to get 10 20 projects in parallel whereas a developer gets to work on one thing yeah i mean it's, a, it's an interesting uh way to look at it so i mean our, our program i mean we are an accelerator so we have a, a portfolio of projects uh and the assumption is not all of them are going to succeed i mean obviously we give them all the same love and care and hope you know, all our babies will, all our offspring will, will be awesome. Um, but I mean, that portfolio mentality is inherent in the fact that some are just not gonna survive versus, versus others. Um, so that, that's good for me as the investor with the portfolio. It's less good if you're the one individual developer that's on the failing side of things. Um, so it comes back to this idea of, of survivability, right? So oftentimes in the game industry, we talk about uh, if you're building your company, how are you gonna make your third game? Right? As, as creators, we're often so focused on, on the product we're building right now, uh, and, and we're not thinking about how do I survive as a studio, how do I, how do I build my startup so that, so that the first game is just the step to the second and third game. And so, I mean, it's, it's really that simple question is, how are you going to survive to make your third game, and what is it? And then they just they had never even thought to think that far ahead uh, into the future. Um, so, now, I mean, thinking about that question doesn't necessarily solve the problem, but does start to enable them to think about the, the question of survivability and, and how do I, you know, um, um, you know not sort of uh, implode when my first one fails. And in, again, in the game industry, um, oftentimes the first game uh, is validation. So uh, we've had examples where some of our teams financially have not done well on the first game. So in terms of revenue, would be considered failures, but the quality of the game uh, was strong enough that that then attracted investors or, or publishers uh, to invest in the second game. So, oh, we like what you did on the first one. That was really cool. You know, here's some funding or here's, here's a contract to do another one. So, so there's sort of, you know, the fact that it didn't generate revenue wasn't as critical, so it enabled them to go make the second and, and, and third game. 
Any more questions? Well, this one? Oh. The microphone is coming. We had drones with microphones as well, but they were too oh. noisy. Jeez. Yes, just I was yeah. curious, what drive you in? Why, why you have so good energy? What uh, is behind? Why do I have yeah. good energy? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, th this is low energy me. I mean, I only arrived yesterday at 5 o'clock, so. Um, so. So why do I have good energy? That's the <laughs> why you do what you do, in other words. Oh. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I love games. I mean, I believe in games as sort of the, the dominant form of expression for the 21st century. I mean, I, I mean I'm, I'm a geek, and, and um, I think games really have the power to change, change the world. So That's we're having great. fun. God bless. Thank you. you. Yeah. I've never been asked that before. Okay. Fun. Okay. One more question. Hi, my hey. name is Alexandra. Um, Hello. I wanted to ask you, did you have the same energy like now when you first failed? Or was it a bomb? Yeah, so, so um, I, I mean, I, I fail all the time. I mean, obviously, there's, there's sort of micro failures that every day, you know, you trip on the step or you, know, you stain coffee on your shirt, whatever. And then obviously, there's the big kind of epic failures. Um, I, I mean, I've had the joy of having been fired from almost every job that I've ever had, uh, once under suspicion of corporate espionage. So that was exciting times. Um, you know, the, fir the first time, I mean, just in the context of being fired, uh, the first time you're really pissed off, right? It's like, well, why did they? And then, and then you realize you've just been liberated, and oh, I'll go do something else. And what have I learned from that? And so then, every other time I got fired, I, I was like, not happy per se, but it's like it didn't, it didn't matter, because you know that you can survive the failure. So this is a bit the sort of comment of running off the cliff. Is once you jump off the cliff so many times, and you realize that it's fine, and you get up, and you just sort of there's a bit of dust, and you keep moving then the cliffs are not so scary. And then you look for the cliffs because, in fact, they're, in, they're exciting. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, when you're just starting off, having this sort of uh, attitude of um, being excited to fail is maybe a bit challenging because you know, you're proud and you don't want to be seen as a failure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I, I mean, I'm not joking when I literally run at cliffs as a means to sort of discover you know, whether it's going to be good or, good or bad. And, um, it's an important lesson, too, from the Lean Startup, this idea that, that failure is neutral, right? It's just a piece of, of learning. Like, you need to jump off the cliff to figure out is it, you know, safe or not or, or whatever. But um, I don't know. I've always had a lot of energy, I suppose, a lot of passion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you, right. Jason. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Enjoyed the rest of your stay in the crest. <laughs>